Thank you for tuning in to Stampscaping 101. This is a video that's dedicated to the coloring of the previous stamp sketches and then lighting video. And this one goes into the coloring portion of this. It's a really long video. You can kind of, you know, scroll along, you know, to specific portions of it. But I don't know, this one right here, I mean, I have used some color schemes that I've used in the past. A couple of them I have not at all. Um, like this one right here, this one, and this one. I don't know. Um, I've done similar things in the past, but a couple of them I just kind of went, you know, completely uh, separate. So I'm kind of having to figure it out as I go along, especially this one right here with these kind of more kind of rusty, you know, uh, reddish rocks in here. It didn't quite go as red as I'd like to, you know, in terms of like a you know, Arizona type of uh, thing, have a soup pie falls or something like that, but that was the kind of thing I had in, you know, my head when I was doing that type of thing, but I don't have some of the colors that I really want to uh, kind of achieve that, but I do like the alcohol marks that are on something like this, so I kind of have to fumble around a little bit, you know, on something like that, but um, I don't know, I did want to go for um, five pretty distinctive looking color schemes here in an, in an you know, approach to um, coloring these scenes just so I don't, you know, end up with them, um, you know, several of the same exact things, you know, it gets a little bit monotonous on my side from having to um, apply it, but, you know, I mean, if I'm doing this, I might as well show some different color schemes and the way they would uh, kind of approach it, but, okay, that being said, in general, we'll notice that, again, from what I was talking about in the previous video, when I was kind of doing um, ink applications and gray tones, I was trying to define the light, and we've defined it even further through the use of some, you know, additional tones to darken in the surrounding areas around our falling water. So, in these scenes right here, you know, in all of these scenes with this type of um, subject matter, I really like those waterfalls to stand out. So. Whatever color scheme I'm working in, I do bring in some of those pale versions of those um, colors into my waterfall, but I don't go like with a super dark color like, you know, that blue up there in the waterfall. It's just a lighter version of it in a kind of warm kind of tones like this, oranges, reds, browns. I come up with, you know, some subtle little, you know, tan values and yellow values into this area right here, just so it doesn't obscure it, and so we can kind of retain and define the falling water as kind of the uh, the focal point of the scene. In many cases, they end up being kind of the light source of the scene, not something like this where I have the actual light moon in there, and that's kind of representing, you know, a light source within the scene, but when we look at these different scenes out here, you know, from the uh, compositional sense, the water, well, this one a little bit down here too in the sky, but um, that water really stands out, and that's what we want it to do in our pieces. Now, in the next video, what I'll do after this one, what I mentioned in this video, is um, I'll f put on the finishing touches in here, and we'll really kind of animate these scenes with some uh, additional um, touches in the form of some uh, pigment ink, some splatter painting perhaps with the bleed proof white and gel pen um, highlights over all of this and hopefully it kind of brings these um, pieces to life even more than they might be just through the coloring process right now okay but anyways if you choose to watch the video i hope you enjoy it and i hope it comes in handy for those that might be kind of uh curious about um different approaches with um waterfall imagery Okay, let's get to the coloring portion of the scenery here, the waterfall scenery. <clears throat> All right, we have a lot of uh, ground to cover here, so let's come out with <laughs> some kind of plan for these. All right, there's different color, color schemes we can, you know, do on these. These one, this one, I'll go with blue because I stamped out my moon in uh, a blue hue here. And usually, I don't know, I mean, we don't have to do it, but I do a lot of my moonlit night scenes um, in blue tones, cool tones. But, I mean, I mean, we could do it in really whatever kind of color scheme we want. And I've done the shading here, the foundational tones, in 
uh, a neutral gray, so we can approach these with whatever kind of color scheme we really want to. You know, except for the moon one where I did that, you know, I stamped out the image in blue, so I'm going to go with that as my color scheme here. Um, but the other ones, I'm not really quite sure what I want to go with. We want to go for some variation here, you know. Uh, just for the sake of it, we have five scenes, so I don't want to do every one of them the same. I'm going to get bored doing that type of thing. So let's just, uh, well, let's just say, let's just start off with this one here. All right, now what I'm going to do in this video is I'm going to um, color these scenes and I'm going to do all of my kind of special effect type of things um, in, you know, the last video. So this will be the next step and uh, not final step, but the, let me see, one, two, third step in the process here. But we're doing this kind of more like a, you know, like a assembly line uh, process here. So I'll try to make it quick and uh, we'll try to move along here just like I did with all, you know, all the gray tones. That's why I just used gray in the last, uh, in the last uh, segment as far as getting my, achieving my lighting schemes and whatnot going. All right, let's see. This brush tip right here is seeing better days. Looks like it's really starting to crumble. This one's probably 15 or 20 years old, I'm guessing. Uh, ClearSnap keeps changing the foam that they use on their uh, tips. <clears throat> and I can tell this one's just not some of the later ones. It's It just has a different consistency to it, so that's why I know how long I've had it, and uh, I've had a lot of these from back in the day when we used to do a really large um, convention circuit um, every year, traveling around Ohio and Massachusetts and Washington and where else. Uh, uh, <clears throat> didn't travel for it, but we used to do the Carson show too, uh, three times a year. And uh, let's see, we used to do San Jose. Santa Days was quite some time ago, though. Um, great times, though. Okay. Um, I'm just going with my reinker, and I have an aqua, which is a very light dye-based ink. And this will just give me a lot of coverage very quickly, okay? And it's one of those things that I recommend. I even have a video just dedicated to the usage of um, reinkers and why they can be a really great idea in terms of kind of expediting the entire process and making at least this medium of dye-based inks on glossy paper in the layered technique, uh, layered um, ink technique, really, really easy, okay? This is something just a lot of people just don't do, and uh, you don't have to. I didn't do it for a long time, but when I started doing it, it made things so much easier, especially in my workshops when you get, you know, 20 or 30 people that haven't done this before. And you just can't get around to everyone um, immediately, you know, because you have so many people to get around to. But when I started them off like this with the uh, reinker, I just put a little reinker like that into their thing. And we all started with them. Um, a blue tone scene first, you know, I just, we worked through um, four different shades of blue like that, and including the reinker there. And it was, uh, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but it is really difficult to get kind of an, an unintentional mark, you know, or undesirable, und undesirable mark, rather. You know, meaning they don't just, you know, like a big oval shape that they can't, you know, blend into their uh, surrounding. It's just literally impossible, you know, when you're starting off with that ringer fluid because it, you get so much and there's such a big slathering of ink, it's just really, really hard to do anything wrong. So, um, and that goes for like all the other colors, you know, so we might start off with a re -inker like that, but when we have that as a foundation, it really, really gives a good coating and then people can also feel how much ink should be used and they get the feeling so when they're going with all their other colors other brands of inks it doesn't really matter the ink is so slick on the surface that it makes it um, just so easy to apply 
And then if you do like the worst technique possible like that and squeeze out a thing like that, that just blends right into your paper. So highly recommended. You don't have to go with reinkers on every color either. I'm just talking about maybe three, four reinkers. You know, reinkers for you know your different color schemes. You can go with a, a blue is always a good one, a pink and a yellow. I don't like a kind of a tan, like a brownish one, you know, that really is utilized quite a bit in scenic stamping, you know, those kind of earthy tones. Now the other ones, the yellow and the blue, can mix to form green. And then you have your pink and blue for your violet tones, and then the pink and yellow can form your, um, your orange tones for things like sunsets and whatnot, your warmer tinged scenes, okay? All right, so we're going with a, a darker blue. It's kind of more of a, a medium tone blue. And you can kind of see that real crystalline bluish tone like that, you know, for this like cool night. Okay, see that kind of playing in? See how I'm still going with like, you know, a pretty light touch, but I don't have to go with a really light touch. I can go like the heaviest touch possible and it still just blends in just fine, and that's because I've used that reinker down there. So, people say, you know, oh, okay, I need practice and practice and practice. Well, you know, when I taught this technique here, you know, there were a lot of people that hadn't done it before. Most people hadn't done this technique before, and they get it, like, in five minutes, you know, if they use a reinker. Highly recommend it. I can't recommend it enough, so I haven't gotten that point across. And, uh, I, you know, and if you don't have, it doesn't mean you have to have a ring inker and a pad. Like for these lighter tones like that, I almost never stamp out something that light. Well, sometimes I might with a cloud or something like that, but, you know, colors that you're not making impressions out of, you can just skip the pad and just go right with re -inker. The re is going to have a lot more ink in it to use for your purpose of kind of coloring your scenes. And... They're the same price, but they're just going to give you so much ink. I have some of the reinkers, and I use a lot of ink, and I've done a lot of scenes, and I've taught workshops, and it takes me a really long time to uh, go through one inker, reinker. Like, I'm hardly ever dipping into a new reinker for really any of my pads. Black, maybe, but just for my own personal use? Black, because I, you know, I'm doing demonstrations and stuff like that at conventions, um, or I just started doing that again, but um, uh, otherwise, I, you know, even one for myself, it, it'll last me years and years and years and years. Okay, so that being said, there's my um, kind of medium tone blue. I'm retaining some of the areas that I've left lighter, okay? See, so, you know, there's some of these areas right here on the uh, on the rocks, and you notice in my water, I haven't just toned them all out. I've left them largely lighter than my surrounding area. Okay. Uh, sometimes that's a little bit too stark white, you know, so I might come in here with a really light touch, you know, and put a few streaks of color across things like um, light sources, such as a moon. Okay. All right, adding some more shadows down here at the base of my rocks. In the waterfall, I'm going to have that churning water there, so I'm not going to add a darker tone at the base of that rock, because that's, you know, the base of the, uh, the falling water, but right around here, kind of in the shallows or whatnot. Actually, I should make that more shallows with some uh, more rock textures down there. But anyways, I'll add more tone in like that. And I mean, this isn't taking too long here. What have we gone on? We've gone on 10 minutes. I'm almost done with the coloring process, you know, having already kind of started off with the coloring process using my gray, um, gray tones like this. So it really kind of expedites the process. It changes things a little bit having kind of that gray foundation, though. But, I mean, it looks pretty good as far as having that in the mix, okay? Sometimes things, you know, colors can might look a little bit more crystalline if you don't have that um, gray foundation and you just go only in with, say, blue tones like in a scene like this. But 
uh, you know, I, I do like this kind of incarnation of um, this value scheme, color scheme. All right, so here we go. Going up in the sky here with my darkest tone here of, well, this won't be my darkest tone, I'll go with black, but my darker tones, I might not go quite as close to my light source so that I get a little bit more of a transition. So darker tones are kind of more perimeter oriented. Okay. Okay. Adding some tone, darkness down in the shallows or whatever, the quieter pools kind of near us here. Now, on the, some of these rocks right here, okay, I'll have some variation on them just so they're not all just one value. I'm not just going to approach that like it's, you know, something to color in, you know, uniformly. I'll leave some of those areas a little bit darker and some of those a little bit lighter so that it seems a little bit more dimensional that way. And you can just take your cues from the uh, the stamp itself, where there's a darker area on the stamp, you know. In this case, it's more stippled with more dots. I can just hit those areas with a little bit more tone. Okay. You can do our streaks in here like so. Variation. Okay. Just use a nice light touch. Okay. It's like you're sweeping something out the door or something like that. Not with a push broom, though, more like a, you know, a whisk broom or whatnot. Kind of in that motion. Okay, let's go down this rock down here. Okay. You know what color I, I forgot to use? Um, is this Caribbean blue. I think I better switch tips here, though. Okay. Yeah, looks like I used Caribbean blue on this one last time. It has that same kind of warmer blue tinge. Okay, let's add that. This this can kind of warm things up a bit within its own kind of hue. Okay, it's just a warmer blue. Okay. I didn't use Caribbean blue for so long. Um, it just wasn't amongst those first um, 30 colors, I think, that Marvy released. And at some point in time, I just switched to, over to Marvy. Um, I was using other things like um, uh, Vivid um, pads from Clear Snap, right? And I used the Printworks pads, and uh, I don't know, I was just really familiar with the Marvy um, color list, because I used those at a stamp of the hand, and we used the, uh, you know, the Marvy brush markers for all of our coloring, so, um, I don't know. And Marvy is just the brightest of all colors, so I really like them, but I started using their pads, and uh, they came out with another... I don't know, maybe 10 pads after the initial 30, I think. And uh, Caribbean Blue was one of the uh, the latter ones. Okay, so that was that one. That warmed things up a touch, and I don't know, it kind of alters the, um, the temperature um, scheme a little bit. All right, now let's go with um, Prussian Blue. It's really, really dark blue. And it... It really applies quickly, and it, I don't know, it penetrates all of those other colors really fast, so, uh, you know, if you're going with a Prussian blue, just kind of apply it um, accordingly, knowing that it's really going to apply. I mean, not super fast, you know, it's because I have that foundation coating down with my other um, re-inker, Ocean Aqua, but... See that? See how much darker it gets up there with that Prussian blue. Prussian blue—it's just a different consistency than every other 
ink. I'd say within Marvy, but just any ink for some reason. I don't know what it is as far as the chemistry goes, but it really applies and penetrates. But I have a lot of control over it because I applied that reinker ink down there, so the pulp of my paper is a little bit um, um, saturated with ink right now. So it really gives me time to kind of manipulate this and move it around quite a bit. Okay, kind of making my waterfall stand out a little bit more by taking the area around it, right next to it, and making it a little bit darker. Okay, see that right there? Kind of altered it a little bit in here, where it's a little bit lighter and darker there. Okay. Now, see, this is the area. If you've watched uh, the first two scene, um, two videos for this waterfall, I brought in my ledge, and I've paired it with the Gushing Falls, um, the smaller one, and the Gushing Falls large. But what I was mentioning that one, they, they do blend together, but then when you bring in these kind of uh, universal tones into it like this and blend them together with color, that's really where they start to come together even more and it makes for a more seamless looking, um, I don't know, whatever, ledge, I guess. Okay. streaks in the water. Okay, especially down here in the shadows at the base of the uh, the boulders with trees stamp here. done with this one with the coloring process. This is a, you know, this is, there's a lot of space here on a half page, you know, card, half page scene, so. But it can go pretty fast, and we've, you know, we've really saturated this, this um, scene with a lot of tone here, so. It's almost like doing two scenes together, because, you know, the majority of, uh, I think, Scenes that people do are kind of card size, you know, quarter page card, four by six type of uh, type of dimensions. Well, this one's four and a quarter by five and a half, but very similar to a standard four by six. Okay, so you see those waterfalls are really standing out there. color in. It's the colors that um, we stamp at our objects in, or the darkest color within our scene. Usually those are the colors that I end up, you know, um, getting to in the toning process, the coloring process, okay? And that usually is the thing that really kind of uh, brings all of the different elements together. Now I am going over a lot of that light blue, okay? But the light blue is not a lost cause, even if you've covered up a lot of it, or most of it. Okay, because these are transparent inks that we're working with, so... Even the first colors, the base coats, okay, they will affect the overall kind of appearance of the end result. Because they are showing through all of the other colors that have applied over the top of them. Especially, you know, when you use them in, you know, pretty, you know, thick saturation. And I did put a lot of that first color down as my base coat. 
Okay, now I'm kind of creating a little bit more separation between this background fall and the foreground fall by darkening in this area above this foreground fall ledge. Okay. Alright, so we'll do the same on this side. Come down here in the shadows. And up in the sky. I want always to do this, but um, I do kind of enjoy doing this kind of uh, assembly line approach to uh, you know these all these cards here. I wouldn't enjoy doing it if all the cards were the same though, you know, the same exact composition. Like I don't want to do like 20 identical Christmas cards or something like that using a scene, you know, like this. Um, but I don't mind doing like five different compositions and doing all the coloring at one time, then all the, you know, the color box, you know, pigment ink and uh, gel pens all at the same time. It's, it's pretty fun. I don't know if it's because of the process or it's because it's something that I don't do very often. Because as I'm doing that, what I'm doing is I'm thinking about these ones too. Okay, look at that. Doesn't that look like a kind of a cool place to, or a cool visual? I would love to be present at this, you know, a location that, you know, is kind of like this in the moonlight. <clears throat> we were coming back through Yosemite from a, a trip out to Death Valley, and uh, when I'm in Death Valley, even though they're not really close to each other, um, by the time I'm driving out all that way to Death Valley, uh, Yosemite is not that far away. It's like a couple hour kind of detour, you know. But we were I was driving back through Yosemite, not staying there overnight or anything, but just kind of driving through, getting back to LA and having dinner in that uh, Yosemite Valley. And uh, someone said, "Oh, are you guys going to the uh, Moon Bows?" But then, what? What's that? And at, I think it was at Lower Falls in Yosemite. Um, there was a full moon that happened to be that night, and uh, that mist that gets, you know, churned up and, you know, from the waterfall um, creates these, like, moon bows, arcing moon. I don't know if they were color. You can see color in them. You wouldn't think so, but there was these, you know, dif you know distinctive bows of, you know, kind of light forming in the, uh, the mist that were uh, kind of cool to see. And I guess it's one of those things, I guess a lot of people go out to those, you know, that location during those uh, times of uh, the month, if there's enough water going, I guess, too. But I always kind of remember something like that. We should do a moon bow here. It'd look really weird because people are going to think, well, what's that? Well, they really exist. Okay, so there we have it right there. I'm going to add some more things to that one, but there, there's one um, color scheme right here. We can add other color and tones in here, you know, slight tinges of something. You know, we can come in here with the, you know how I use that um, Caribbean blue here. I mean, you could come in with things like alcohol pens and kind of give certain areas kind of more of that kind of warmer tinge, you know, with the use of, um, you know, like a green alcohol pen like this, or you can come up into your water, you know, really kind of pale tones and kind of add it in there and see if you like it. Yeah, but it's just, it's, I don't know, it's just another layer of um, transparent media and hue you know, to go in and kind of enhance your overall 
color scheme in a very subtle way if you want to. So something like that. Okay, all right, let's get to the next one here. All right, so we went all blue tones in here, you know, kind of real um, midnight, you know, summer night type of thing, wherever it might be. I don't know where it is, somewhere in the world, or otherworldly, right? All right, now let's take a look at something like this. Um, Let's do something where we have the water kind of a different hue than the surrounding rocks. All right. Now, as I say that, I'm trying to think of what I want to do. I don't have the answer, but um, maybe we'll do it kind of more like a, you know, a red rocky type of thing or something of that sort. And then I say, yeah, I'm kind of wondering what colors do I want to bring up there. But I'm trying to think of a, something that's going to be kind of in harmony. Um, all right, well, let, let's just get into it. Um, and I promise you, I don't have something kind of in mind right now. I'm not scheming here for the sake of the video, but um, when you start off with kind of lighter tones, okay, you know, there's plenty of wiggle room, you know, in which to kind of explore other types of tones, so... I think I'm going to go with kind of some warm tones on the rocks, you know, to start off with. We have an old paper and tea dye, distress inks. Here's a milled lavender, maybe for the shadows or something like that. I don't know. And then why don't we go with, you know, some blue tones for the water. Maybe it's like a aqua or something like that. Have a soup eye falls or something like that. I don't know. Um, let's see where it goes. Okay, now this is another half page scene. Let's start off with the two big scenes, you know, so we can kind of finish up the, uh, the smaller ones, you know, kind of in a hurry. Um, okay, let's see. Let me use this uh, reinker fluid again and uh, I get a clean applicator. I just washed these off the other day. Okay, let's go with, uh, let's do these two. We'll, we'll have kind of a standard blue tones in the water of these two scenes right here. All right, maybe I'll go with that in the sky as well. I don't know. It won't be like a midnight, you know, hopefully on this one. But let's just do a couple. Let's kill two birds with one stone and really make it kind of more assembly line-ish, at least in terms of a couple areas of these scenes right here. All right, so adding this down roughly in the same area that I did my gray, okay? This is a really pale blue, okay? It's not because it's dry on here and there's not enough ink. That's a lot of people feel when they're going with something so light, you know, they think, oh, it's not coming off. So they think they need to scrub, but it's not. It's just a super light um, value of that hue. In this case, it's blue. So I'm just kind of layering it down, and this is when I can start applying it to some of my waterfalls here as well. Okay. And believe me, this page is now saturated with that very, very light blue ink. Let's bring it up here into the sky as well. Okay. Let me bring some of it down on some of these rocks, just so it, it isn't such a, you know, a foreign hue within a different color scheme that the rocks will end up being, okay? All right, so that was a very light, oh, I almost forgot to do this one right here. Okay, let's do the same thing, checking to see if there's still some ink in this. Let's add this over some of those rocks, maybe these rocks in this one will be kind of more granity or something like that. Okay. Maybe I do need a little bit more tone here. It's almost invisible, isn't it?
Okay. Let's go ahead and work some of those colors right now. Let's go to the uh, um, salvia blue. <laughs> I can barely see any difference. It's just because this is so saturated with the other um, previous ink that I just used, you know, the uh, aqua. And it's not applying very quickly because the paper is really saturated right now, so. But that's not a bad thing. It really gives you a lot of, uh, kind of wiggle room to kind of play around with that um, application of color, okay? Let's do the same thing with this one. This scene. Okay, now let's start moving into, let me just skip my um, really super bright blue right here, that number 10 light blue. And let's go with uh, some of this um, Caribbean blue, this kind of warmer blue. Just to kind of give it a different color scheme than say, you know, this one. Let's try to go for a little bit of variation in terms of our color schemes. You know, I, I, I don't want five, you know, scenes that look exactly the same, you know, from a color standpoint. Well, color and con I don't know, everything standpoint, I don't really like, um, you know, just uh, being caught in a monotony. Okay. All right. There's that. Okay. Okay. Let's do that same thing down here. I forgot to add some of my color up here. Um, and the, these waterfalls up here. Okay, let me go for uh, uh, some of this blue here. Let's see if I can just sop up the remaining blue in this cap right here. some of it down in that water as well. Okay, and let's hit it with some of the uh, Caribbean blue. You can do this with pens too, okay? Go with your alcohol pen if you don't have this color or anything similar, okay? soup I falls on. <laughs> I think the first time I saw some photographs of that, um, just kind of a stand, I was like thinking, is the water that turquoise there? It's really astounding. I've never been there, but I've had friends that have backpacked down there. some of those waterfalls. This is kind of an awkward tool to do this with, but 
you know, because it's fairly wide, so I'm just trying to use a little bit of the tip to apply some color. Okay. Oh, here's another fall here. I almost forgot about that one. Must be blind. Okay. Okay. I'm going to be careful that I don't take those waterfalls in there too dark. I want to make the rocks around them darker, but I haven't applied any color at all, you know, to this point. Okay, but let's start doing that now. Okay, let's try this old paper. I think old paper, I don't think I'm going to be able to see it. My fingers are really inky. Um, I don't think I'm going to be able to see anything, but this could provide me with kind of a foundation. Well, you can kind of see it in there. It's kind of a warm tinge. Um, I was going to say, even if I couldn't see it, it would provide kind of a foundation um, for my other colors to come. Okay. Now, I don't want these rocks to be this color, but it's just, again, it's a base coat for my other tones. Okay, now this is a really light color, so I'm going to actually bring some of it into the water, too. Just so that the two areas, you know, water and land, rock, or whatever, aren't so kind of uh, unrelated, okay? So I want to have some relationship between those two areas. And I'll put it up in the sky, too, okay? Like down on that water to give that kind of water a kind of a even stronger glow. Some kind of warmth, kind of glowing in there a little bit. All right. All right, let's move up to tea dye. Tea dye starts getting a little bit darker, I think. Let's test it out. It does. It's not real dark or anything like that. I keep seeing areas that I forgot with my um, blue. Here's another little area of water, falling water right in here. Okay. All right, tea dye. Alright, so I've kind of left, you know, retained some areas that have, of lightness. Okay, but I haven't been using really dark tones. This tea dye itself is really um, pale in terms of the value as well. Okay, let's try to bring in some of this milled lavender, okay? I don't know what it'll look like, but it seems like a good concept, at least, in terms of uh, hitting some of the shadows, you know, maybe some of the shadows will be cool tones or whatnot, just varied a little bit. Looks pretty good, I think. And I know what you're thinking, you're saying, all right, well, where do you hit the shadows, you know? Well, you can see the darker areas on these rocks, right? You can see the lighter areas on the designs themselves, okay? So look for your imprints and just color in those darker areas, okay? Just, just reiterate what's already on the images, okay? And if you do that, you'll be just fine. There are other types of lighting schemes, but 
kind of when you're starting off, you know, you can just kind of follow the design in general. If there's a lighter area of the design, meaning less stippling, less dots, then leave those areas light if you want to, and it'll look great. I would bring some color in over the top of it, but I'm just saying don't, you know, don't come into it with like the medium darker tones. Go ahead and just hit it up with like, you know, some of the lighter tones that you're working in. All right, so a little bit different, see that right now? See, so is it looking a little bit more dimensional maybe? All right, let me see. Those distress inks are looking great on there, I think. Walnut stain. This is the one I'm not sure about. Fire bed. Do I, do I, dare I use that? I don't know. It doesn't really look like red rocks, you know. But it might look pretty good, you know, in terms of that kind of red rockish looking uh, color scheme. Okay, this is walnut stain. A little bit of a deeper brown. Okay. I'm following my shading area too, okay? There's more kind of heavily condensed black dots, you know? Just add more tone to them, just to reiterate that lighting shading scheme. And dimensional maybe getting there if it isn't or more dimensional than it looked when it was just stamped okay all right let's try out some of this red let's just go for it here I'm not gonna just go crazy with it I'm gonna bring it in a, in a couple areas and see if I like it okay will it look like that I don't know what kind of rock that is those really reddish rocks on uh, some areas I don't think it's I don't think it's rose granite like uh, out in Joshua tree well I know it's not unless it just has maybe it's the same but it has more like iron in it or something yeah it's a little bit adding that kind of reddish tinge in there I think I want it a little bit more like a warm red though. Well, you know, which means I'll just have to layer, put an extra layer on top of it. This one's a good one to start off with though. It's kind of giving me a little hint of, you know, that color without having to make a big commitment to it, you know, in a very bold application or something like that. Yeah, coming around a little bit. Go with some of that down on the foreground rocks as well, as they would probably be related. rock falls. Those ones are a little bit redder because I didn't use so much. Let me mix in some of those walnut stain down here.
potter's clay. This is the one I was thinking about right here to blend into it. I don't want that color right there, but I think it'll look good over the top of this other, you know, tinge. Uh, <laughs> red, reddish tinge that I've already laid down. And over the uh, walnut stain and all those other distress inks in there. Yeah, it looks okay. I want it. I want it to be like real aged rock, you know, and kind of weathered, but kind of in that really strong kind of red rocky spirit. If I can, I don't know. Thing is, it's just gonna keep just keep layering it. I know I didn't, it didn't do it, but it seems like the more I apply of that color, that potter's clay right in here, it almost seems like it's making it lighter. I know it's just making it darker. Maybe it's making it brighter, but dark, but it is darker. Okay, so that was the potter's clay right there, so, well, kind of. Not quite, you know, that color scheme that, uh, can be found in kind of the thing that I'm thinking about, but I think this looks okay in terms of the hue that's been achieved. I mean, I, I don't know, I'd have to play around with some other types of color ink combinations, you know, in the future, but uh, I don't know. I'll live with that. I think that's all right. Okay, so. But that's not all I'm doing. I'll, you know, bring in some other tones in here, too. Here's this brown. I'll, and I will go all the way to black here, too. So, yeah, let's see this brown right here. I might not want to use this brown, but this is the Marby number six brown. Yeah, it looks okay. If anything, I do think that kind of adding these additional layers in here, you know, layer upon layer, I do think that you know, some of these forms in here are starting to look a little bit more um, kind of three-dimensional and modeled, which is good. Okay, all right, I think we can get to black here. Okay. Hit it in the shadows. If there are darker areas on the rocks in the design, just kind of hit it with some of this. Yeah, I'm not necessarily... I'm using black ink, but it, it's more of a, a gray tone that's being applied, okay? I'm working with the sponge, so, you know, when you're doing that, you know, it's very, very light, okay? Gosh, was I working? I hope I wasn't working out of frame there for a lot of this video. Sorry about that. When I'm applying um, with this applicator, most often I'm using kind of like smaller tips like this. I'm using the edge of it kind of more than I am the full thing. If I have a full area to cover it, then I'm using the full thing, but kind of in the tighter details, I'm just using a small portion of it.
some shadows down here where there are shadows already existing. down the water is still this blue ink is still pretty um, wet because I can still move my black ink right over the top of it pretty easy okay left and right corner top left and right corner Okay, there we have that. I'll add more things to it, but uh, that's it for now. So, a couple different color schemes working right now. This could use a little zip of something else, though, on those rocks. I, I don't know, I was thinking I was being too uh, conservative with my kind of reddish application. I don't have a. Let me see if I have any other reds. There's a cranberry red. I don't, I don't want that one. I want kind of a warmer red, like a rust red or something. But not quite that potter's clay. Kind of more reddish. Well, let me try this one right here. Let's add some of the here and there. Maybe to the shadows. blue now too. Let's, let's go ahead and deepen that blue. Alright, let's just go with the number three blue. It's like a navy blue. Okay. I'm kind of hitting it in the shadow area where it's darker. Darker area. Darker color, you know. Okay. something. I don't know. I, I guess I needed the water to match the um, kind of the value scale that's going on in the rocks a little bit closer at least. Maybe not totally uh, completely as you know dark everywhere but just in some areas. Yeah it's looking a little bit more matched now. So right there. So a little bit of a darker area in that water. Let's just uh, do a simple application with this one. Huh. 
Let's say. Let's play around with this one. Let's let's not go too dark with this one, okay? Like I have with the previous couple. I'm trying to find a clean applicator here. All right, let's switch out this paper here too. Maybe use the back side of it. Okay, let's change some hue around it here. Let's like make this one a little bit lighter, kind of in spirit. All right, this is a rosemary. Really, really quite a bright pink, so I don't want to use it kind of in its full strength like that. It's too much, right? So you just kind of blot it down a little bit. I might have taken off too much, but let's kind of hit this in some areas right in here. It's really kind of grabbing my applicator because it's just so... The paper is just so dry. So this isn't really gliding, so I'm going to try to be careful to give it really, really light touch, okay? And get just a really kind of diffused application of that color down. Yeah, you know, my sky like that. See that? Okay. Those are the colors of the sky. Maybe we'll have them reflecting in our water. Okay, so I'll try to <laughs> bring a little bit down into that water as well. Just use a really light touch. It's actually applying too much of it, but I'll diffuse that later with the use of pigment ink. Okay, here, that's what I want right there. Much more subtle. So we have some of it down in our water. It's really a terrible application of it with this because I had I didn't go in here and kind of tone in there again to kind of give it a good foundation. But it's really not going to matter once I use the uh, the pigment ink over the top of it and the uh, the uh, um, uh, gel pens and uh, Dr. Martin's bleed proof white. Actually, well, that's not too bad. Let me go for a little bit more of a bold application with this tone. Maybe it's um, kind of the twilight hour or something, maybe. <laughs> that, that's a little bit too pink, but let's try to kind of mute it a little bit with some of this. Let's try the milled lavender uh, first here. Okay. Yeah, good. Marble inks are pretty thick, so I mean, I mean thin, so they really penetrate and apply. The Ranger Industries one are, are thicker, so it gives you a little bit more time to kind of, you know, move them around. I like using kind of the thicker inks and thinner inks in conjunction with one another. I like the thicker inks as my kind of foundation coats. And then I like to go with the Marvies right on top because they'll penetrate and I'll see some results of my coloring um, a little bit faster because they penetrate through thicker coatings of ink. Whereas if you keep using all thick types of ink, sometimes you know it's really hard to apply it because um, the paper becomes super saturated with them so much faster. Okay, so here's kind of a kind of a muted, subtle kind of a color scheme that's working in here. Um, and I've applied some of this milled lavender over the tops of my rocks as well. Okay. All right. I have a couple other um, cards here. Um, let's do... Um, I'm trying to think of, think of a different color scheme here. Oh! Um, Why don't we go with, do I go with a warm tone scene in this one, just for kicks? Let's do that on this one. Let's say that there's a kind of a sunset or something like this, you know, and I'll have this kind of glowing with warm tones. We want to go for something different in each one of these, okay? 
or maybe there's you know an aurora borealis or something over this one so we have this greenish tinge in here i'm not really sure uh, I know what I'm doing on this one, but let's just take care of that one right now. Oh, I'm going to have to clean off all my stylus tools again. I'm going through so many different color schemes on you know, just this. These five cards here, all in kind of the same video. All right. Mustard seed, yellowish tinge, okay? That sure looks ugly. <laughs> it's not the only color that we're going to be using on here, okay? I uh, used to go hiking. I say used to, because I don't know, when I'm heading up there again, I have to get in shape again, but um, this place called Sheephole Wilderness, and there was the Sheephole Mountain. And uh, it's out in the desert, and uh, um, the canyon that you kind of access the summit, you know, from um, has all those red rocks, and they're I guess they're full of iron or something like that. That's why they're kind of reddish and kind of rusty, you know, looking. But right around sunset, when you're walking back, you know, inevitably, you know, you're walking back through that during sunset because it takes like all day to get up there and come back down. So usually you're kind of racing the clock, you know, the sun. But coming back to that canyon, it's just absolutely glowing with kind of orange, you know, rocks. And I always wish I could stay in that area during that time of day, but you have to kind of get out of there because it's really hard to navigate that canyon. Um, in the dark, even with lamps, headlamps. Okay, I'm applying this um, color, yellow, into my waterfalls, but I'm trying to keep it where I can just get a kind of a subtle um, coloring of them without darkening them too much, because I do want those to stand out still as my, you know, focal points within the scene, so you have to kind of make them lighter. It's kind of like keeping them in the spotlight, you know, you might think of it like that. Okay. All right. just yellow, the Marvy yellow. And, I mean, it's not darker, it's about the same hue as the mustard seed and value of the mustard seed, so I won't go... too much... it won't be a too much of a different application than the previous color. I don't know, this one's kind of going crazy with the uh, the warm tones, maybe because I just went through, I don't know, a kind of bunch of scenes there with, uh, you know, generally cooler tones. So I'm, I'm compensating right here, I don't know. Alright. So I know it looks pretty weird. It looks pretty weird to me, too. But kind of working through this general kind of color scheme right here. And we're doing for something that's fairly dramatic in terms of the, uh, you know, this warm light kind of, uh, over everything. This is, a uh, ochre, if I didn't say. So kind of working incrementally darker. incrementally darker and through the color scheme that we're, we're depicting. It might end up being like a, a waterfall on Mars when they're 
when there was water there. <laughs> or if there was water there one day, once, once upon a time. Here it looks like I used some uh, reinker in there, and it just kind of maybe I used too much. I was thinking, what is that? There's some ink all over it. A lot of my pads are really starting to break down, though, in terms of the fabric. Maybe that's what's happened there with that uh, that color. All right, this is a terracotta. Hmm. I don't use too much of that one. All right. Okay, just when you move into kind of your darker tones, just be careful not to uh, eradicate the areas that you want to retain the lightness of, mainly. In this case, the waterfalls, but sometimes on the, maybe the top sides of some of your rocks or something like that to make them look a little bit more three-dimensional. I'm being a little bit more selective about my placement now. Like on some of these rocks, I want to kind of model them. See my cameras. There we go. This right in here, there's some cracks in those rocks and just different little areas within there. Okay. I think we'll go in and. Uh, Kind of hit some of these areas in here, but we'll maybe we'll do it with the alcohol pens. I think that might be easier for me to get a little bit more detailed with a detailed, you know, instrument in terms of a kind of the color scheme. Pens have that nice fine point that we can utilize. This brown right here, the number six Marby Brown. Just really rich and it it can really mellow areas out that are just too bright too. It just kind of makes them a little bit more earthy. The distress inks are pretty good for that too. They're not quite as bright though. But um, they definitely have that nice aged kind of look and kind of knock down some of the super hotness of certain color um, intensities.
<laughs> my waterfalls are almost standing out way too much, you know, because I've taken the areas around and really made them quite dark. Kind of creating a little bit of separation again from this waterfall and that background rock back, back in the distance. black on this one because this one's more much more subtle in terms of the uh, kind of the color scheme or kind of pastels and you know it's about softness then you know um, maybe drama drama dramatic I don't know um, dramatic color transitions and uh, contrasts. Alright, <laughs> I think that's dark enough. Kind of looks crazy in terms of how dramatic that is. Let me use a little bit more black on this one. I couldn't get very much darker because the scene was so wet at the time. With ink, so, you know, the ink wasn't transferring very, uh, well, I, it's not a bad thing though, it's, it's good. Um, because it's easier to manipulate and get things nice and smooth when things are wet, but when things are really wet, it's sometimes it's hard to apply more color on it because you know, the surface of the page, or the pulp of the paper is getting super saturated, therefore the surface of the page isn't accepting any more ink. You know, because it's not absorbing it, it's not staining it. But you can always just wait for it to dry a little bit and go back into it, like that. Okay, we have one more scene. I don't know, this is probably too much. It was probably too much. If I was coloring them all the same kind of color scheme, it would have came together much faster, but... Um, okay, let's hit it with... Um, I have green on this from... This is the green that I used last week on that... Um, Aurora Borealis thing. Look how much ink. I just have these sitting on top of my desk, too. You know, it just comes to show you just how much ink, you know, these pads can really hold. And for how long, even just sitting out. Now, it's not real dry where I am right now, but um, still pretty, uh, pretty juicy. All right, let's do a different color scheme here, okay? Oh, let's go for, let's go for more of like an aqua you know, scene, but let's leave this up in here, kind of more, a little bit more granite type, you know, kind of Yosemite granite looking. All right, so that being said, I'm just going to, I'm kind of coming up with that, con, you know, that color scheme just kind of for convenience sake too, because I already have green in this and I want to utilize it. Okay, so I'm just going to add some blue to it um, using my reinker fluid. I have a lot of water down here. And let's just take that in there like so. Okay, and uh, we can bring that up into, ah, uh, it's a little bit too much. Bring that up into that 
a waterfall, falling water, gushing falls specifically. Okay. I can get some of that into my rocks too, just so there isn't so much of a, like I said, separation of uh, color schemes going on. Let's go with a pretty bright blue here. This is the number two, uh, 10, Marvy Blue. Now I stamped out all of my water pattern textures in this scene in black ink, so I'm going to see if I can achieve kind of more of a, a nice uh, kind of crystalline look. I know I normally do that just by using colors out of my color scheme, mainly blues. Let's see if I can kind of get it a little bit that way, just using, um, you know, ink on top of black here. I don't want it to look kind of ominous and stormy looking. I still want it kind of more tranquil. the number 10 blue. It doesn't look like, you know, number 10 blue because there's so many other colors kind of mixed into it at this point in time. Try the Caribbean. Caribbean blue. Yeah, I can see a bit of a difference there. A little bit more greenish blue. It does have a nice kind of brightness to it and clarity. That's pretty good. Now do you see how there's so much intensity down here in the water and we can see that there's kind of a disconnect between those rocks up there because the rocks aren't rendered now as heavily as the water is so that we do have to kind of match those up again. So let's bring in some additional tones in that area. All right. So let's try, you don't have to make it as dark or anything like that, but just in terms of the rendering of it, it, it needs to kind of have a richness and um, kind of a, a solidification, <laughs> I guess, of that color scheme that's going on in those areas. So let's, I'm going to hit it with some blue so that maybe instead of just gray, it'll look kind of more kind of a steel blue or something like that. Okay. I don't want it to look too heavy though. So I'll just hit it with the uh, the blue for right now. The salvia blue specifically. Okay. So a little bit more tone on there. do something for the sky as well. A little of that color. And then, okay, now let's see what half of here I was just using for that black. Here's the black. And now we'll hit this again. We'll, I'll try to model these rocks a little bit more. Getting a little bit of variation in them. And uh, kind of some opacity.
I cannot wait to get into some of these scenes, or all of them, and add those kind of um, little finishing touches with the, uh, you know, the pigment ink and the uh, splatter painting and gel pen highlights. It's going to be a blast. Okay, look at that now. See how kind of dramatic that can look? That extra color. So, the rocks in there are really pretty simplistic. You know, I added a little bit tinge of blue up there and uh, some grayscale um, using black. And, I don't know, I think it... It kind of blends and matches this bottom section here now a lot more. So we've kind of brought those two together. I am adding shading with this, and this I could have done that, I guess, in the previous video when I was just doing grayscale. But I don't know. I, I you know, like on this one, it wouldn't have been appropriate. Um, the one that was really light to have a bunch of black up here. I think it's better kind of left, you know, a little bit more subtle, you know, kind of in that lighter spirit. So um, sometimes it's good to kind of lay down your color first before you decide how much black you want to apply to a you know, given scene. Unless it's a nighttime scene or something like that where you just know it's going to get pretty dark in there anyway. Or everywhere anyway. Okay, so let's take a look here. and see where we are with these pieces. Okay, so I think I'm done with my inks for now. I would probably spend a little bit more time if, you know, I had one video dedicated to one scene, but um, um, I think this is sufficient on each one. I know I say that, but if I see something that I, you know, feel like changing, I'm sure I will, or adding to. Okay, let's see here. Got that. Hopefully you get a nice variety here. Different, um, different color schemes and whatnot. But this is where we're at right now. Okay. Yeah, an hour and a half for five pieces. And five pieces, it's more like seven, though, really because of all the, uh, you know, the work on the half-page scenes right here. Okay. I really need to add some more color to this one, I think, now. Um, spray sealing this will bring out some tones in there. Okay, but anyways, um, that is just using inks, and that's part of coloring, okay? But these days, we have a lot of other options, like alcohol pens, so we take, you know, a color like this, which is a uh, pale lilac or something like that. See that one right there? I mean, that really matches with kind of this color scheme right here, right? So, let's take this. And we can kind of go in and add some additional tones. This is really pale, too, but I can add some of this more down in, you know, some areas of my water, like this. And what other colors did we use in here? We used, you know, really pale blues, so this is pale blue. That's what the name of this one. This, this is an alcohol pen, it's Marvy. Uh, La Plume Permanent, meaning it's just permanent aspect, meaning it's alcohol-based. It's not permanent and being light fast. It would probably fade, I'm guessing. Okay, so here's this pale blue. Let's let's just do this on all of them, okay? I can hit them in really specific areas. It's re I can barely see it right here myself um, as far as any changes, but it's very subtle, and it's just adding in kind of another base layer. I can get in certain areas on my rocks if I want to, or I can put additional streaks into my water. This is the color it is. It's, it's, I wouldn't be surprised if it's like a 5% blue or something. But 
but a lot more specific in terms of your areas that you can, you know, color in. Okay, but, you know, sometimes you just need just a slight hue, you know, just a slight tinge of something like here on the rock or something or wherever. Okay. Okay. Um, this one I got a little bit, you know, into that Caribbean blue. Here's the uh, melon here. Maybe add a little tinge of uh, some green to some of these rocks just to kind of change the uh, or expand on the the color scheme of the piece. And it relates to, you know, that Caribbean blue. It's more of a greenish blue. Okay. Uh, did I use that one on this one? I can't remember. <laughs> this certainly relates to this color scheme as well. Like that. Okay, this green down here. I think this would look great in this piece right in here. You can add some of this green, a little tinge like that. Yeah, that looks really good. It's very subtle, so... Okay, let's take a look at this one right here. Aquamarine. Hmm. Alright, so it's just going with some very, you know, light applications, or, I don't know, that could be a heavy application on some of those, but with some very light tones, though. Very, you know, real pale tones. Periwinkle. Okay, how about that one on here? Let's hit it. some of these rocks, some of the shadows down in these rocks. With some of that purple. gray. Cool gray. Let's hit the shadows on these rocks a little bit more. Let's render them a little bit more. This is a cool gray number five. Alright, let me zoom in a little bit more. We're doing some kind of detailed work here. Okay, so you can see the top of this rock's a little bit darker down here. It's because of that's the way I colored it, but there's also kind of more dots in these areas, see, where it's real heavily condensed like that. So I can come in here and just kind of reiterate that with a little bit, of, you know. That's the beauty of these pens right here. It doesn't look like anything's going, but this is how dark it is right here, okay? And it doesn't show up too much because the value of that color in there is already that dark, okay? 
but it just kind of adds that extra layer. But now areas where it's a little bit lighter, say I can kind of come in here like that and I can hit some areas down in these shadows down here. So there's rocks right back in here. I can color like half of it like that. Or if I want that waterfall to stand out a little bit more, I'll darken the area right next to it like so. It's kind of gotten a little bit dark in here, but you know, if you wanted to add a little subtle green or something like that to your trees, you certainly could. But look at this rock right in here, just add a little bit of shadow to the base of it, or you know, down here in the, the water. Kind of anchors those rocks a little bit more. See these areas down here where there's this crack in this rock and this ledge, I can just go and separate that a little bit more with some additional tone like that. Like getting a little bit more rendered. Yeah, I mean it's really fun coloring those things too. In this little area down here, a little, a little bit more tone. Let's say this is the shuttle art one. Okay, a little bit of a different blue. It's an alcohol ink pad, um, pen as well. kind of, it's too bluish, so I'll just blend that out a little bit with this gray, okay? Alright, let's take a look in here. Let's do the same thing in a couple of these other ones right here. So this crack right here, let's just go in and reiterate that. A little bit more, you know, specific application of gray than with uh, the stylus tool. This is blue, but I mean, you, you can certainly use a gray scale tone. These alcohol pens won't smear your um, dye-based inks because it's not the same binder, so it's not going to put your dye-based inks back into solution like water would, okay? But they do have the same property in terms of the transparent aspect of it, so if you interview color up, color over your dye-based ink work, you're not just covering it up with an opaque mark, it's transparent, so those undercolors are still going to you're gonna you're going to benefit from all that work that you did. Because it'll just look that much richer and deeper. Look how rich and deep that looks right there. Okay. See this area on these rocks right here where it's darker? cracks in the rock. Let's just go in and reiterate that a little bit with some additional marks, tone, and you can go with a lighter gray than this, you know, just, or you can use a couple grays in conjunction with one. It doesn't have to be one or the other. Too many people kind of, they think in the polar extremes, so they think if you use one thing that you can't do another, you know. But I always say, well, 
you know, use it in the way that you want to use it. It doesn't have to be a, a complete replacement. So if you're using dye-based inks, doesn't mean you can't use your alcohol pens. You know, you can do mixed media. This pen is certainly a better tool for doing very specific applications of color than, you know, a large sponge applicator such as the uh, stylus tool, even though you can get pretty good areas with the stylus tool, but not quite as good as, you know, a fine tip like this point. Okay, just added some of that water, some into that waterfall. Let's blend that out a touch with some blue. If you go alcohol pen over alcohol pen, it will, you know, kind of dissolve that previous alcohol pen and it'll put it back into solution. But that's good because you can kind of blend it in. You can blend your colors in. Alright. See that right there? Okay, this one I would say needs a little bit of work here in terms of uh, kind of bringing it around in terms of the color scheme. Let's start with something really light, though. This is that apricot. Did I use that on here already? I can't remember. Kind of want to go a little bit more, kind of a rusty tinge on here. It's actually, it's kind of warming it up a little bit, too. So if you don't have something, <laughs> one media, in this case, alcohol, um, I mean, a uh, dye-based inks, then you can use your alcohol pens if you have those colors, or the color that you're looking for in that incarnation. Okay, let's see. Let's go with a... Let's go with a... Pale pink? Is that right? Pale pink. Kind of pink is a lighter version of red, right? So kind of apply that in here. Some of the base coat, I guess. So I can get into these individual rocks if I want to now. And let's move up into kind of a warmer tinge of something. That is really too bright. There's too many pastel. I, I have a gigantic set of uh, alcohol pens, but I'm not running into a color that I really kind of want. I'll have to see, like I said before, if I can kind of mix and match. This is a soft pink. Okay. Fluorescent orange. Eh, no way. Potato brown. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, a little bit too bright. Yeah, way too bright. Um, sometimes I'll use a certain color that's way too bright, but then I'll just go back with a nice dull color like that, and I'll kind of just blend it in. It'll kind of dilute it and blend it into the uh, surrounding area. Okay. 
It's not too bad. It's a little bit too uh, bright, but still. Let's go with this one right here. This one is the apricot. That's orange. Try that. It's giving me the intensity, but not quite the color I want. All right, let me see that. Where's that vermilion? All right, let me get some of that color laid down in there that I can kind of blend out and into the surrounding area. It's time to get a little bit more bold and just go for it here. Okay. So I'm kind of putting these little marks on here, but in a sense I'm just kind of creating some puddles that I can kind of pull out and blend in. Okay. Because you hit it with the lighter tones and it really dissolves that ink, you know, as alcohol inks do, and then you can kind of spread them around and you know, blend them in. I like using, instead of blend, I mean, you could use a blender one. And I do have a blender one, but I just like using lighter colors of that color scheme. Okay. That red almost looks like, it reminds me of like a drop of blood or something like that. Kind of putting in some uh, little that uh, I've built up so much uh, alcohol in some of these um, rocks, I can go in and do that thing where you kind of have those alcohol -like textures in here, which wouldn't be bad for these rocks and uh, you know that type of formation. Um, let's see. Let's do it with the uh, apricot. Okay. So I can kind of remove ink by doing this too, going back into a lighter tone. I'm not going to be removing dye-based ink, but I can remove some of that alcohol ink in strategic areas. 
mainly the top sides of uh, you know rocks where it will, it will give the illusion of being you know top lit okay Those textures are looking pretty cool on those rocks, I'd have to say. And it's, it's just giving, you know, that alcohol inky texture that, you know, we wouldn't be able to achieve with dye-based inks um, without doing some sort of bleaching technique, maybe. It's not really removing it, it's just kind of putting it back into solution and it's kind of going out in that kind of puddle. vibrant. Um, and that's kind of the look I was going for. I don't want something kind of just dull, right? Now this one certainly doesn't um, suffer for kind of a lack of, you know, intensity and vibrancy. Um, this is Camel here. Just going and rendering some of these rocks a little bit more. Okay, that's a little bit too, a little bit too dark. Let's see. Here's a pale yellow. Darker than I think, unless I picked up some colors from those other application layers. And actually, that's not too bad. Okay, all right. Something like that. All right, let's see where we're at. That looks sufficient in terms of our coloring here. You know, five scenes. Now they took a long, you know, took a little bit longer than I thought, but you know, I went for five completely different color schemes that needed, uh, you know, some different things for each. Uh, uh, I don't know scheme. But, um, I don't know, five pretty different looking pieces in terms of our color schemes. Um, you know, and like I said, you can go for more, kind of a more whimsical one. Go with, you know, go for a purple colored scheme or if you want to or something like that. But um, that is the coloring here. And we went in and we really kind of rendered these pretty, you know, uh, detail oriented, you know, in terms of... Um, you know, going in and, you know, modeling our, um, our rocks, our whole areas as well, as, you know, as well as individual little parts in here. And, 
we'll go in and uh, put in some finishing touches on this um, in the final video to come. So anyways, as far as some coloring schemes go, I hope this uh, comes in handy for you in terms of uh, giving you some ideas. I guess the biggest thing of all of this that, you know, for me, okay, now we go pretty dark right here and we can see just, you know, the drama, you know, that contrast can bring to uh, falling water, but the falling water is much lighter than the uh, surrounding areas, meaning those rocks right there, so that really stands out and it makes for a, you know, pretty contrasty, a wide, con you know, ranging um, value scheme, you know, jumping from something very light to something very dark, you know, quickly. This one here is the kind of the opposite, all right? Well, I don't know if it's an opposite, but it's just, you know, it's a, it's a much narrower range of that white next to that, I don't know, maybe 45% gray or something like that, as opposed to like, you know, white next to practically, I don't know, 90% or something like that. So it's a, you know, a different look right there. Um, we went for kind of color on one thing, but just kind of more of a muted color scheme right there. But I have some of those muted colors kind of coming up in here. So no matter what kind of color scheme we're working with, uh, you have those very pale versions of it coming up into that waterfall, not something really dark. If it was really dark and filled in in here, it wouldn't really stand out and it wouldn't really be the uh, kind of the focal point of the scene. Here we kind of change, you know, our color schemes around, you know, between uh, the surrounding area, meaning the rocks, and the waterfalls themselves, and that really, really creates a quite of a separation right there as well in terms of, you know, a huge change between water and rock. Okay, so um, kind of going for, I don't know, some sort of a statement on, a, you know, a, I don't know what time of day that would be, twilight or something like that, or I don't know, maybe sunset or something like that, but this one, you know, the, the waters are truly kind of glowing in, you know, some way. This one would be good to have a little subtle blue up there or something like that. Let me try that right here. This is pale blue. I like going for a hue change sometimes if it's just something's all um, one temperature. Okay, so I'll just put it around in a couple little areas. It's not going to stand out too much because this is blue practically, pale blue practically white. Okay, but it's just a way to go in and add a touch of a tinge of a, another temperature. You, it's probably invisible to you. I can barely see it myself. It's super subtle. But anyways, we'll add in some uh, kind of light in here. In this one right here, it's almost like the, you know, the, the waterfalls themselves are the light source. Okay, so anyway, that is it for the coloring portion of this video. The set, I should say. And I am looking forward to kind of adding some finishing touches. I think there's some other images that can be placed in here. Just some subtle textures and whatnot. Nothing too drastic. And then we'll go in and I'll add in our kind of uh, special effects within these uh, scenes in the next video. And that is something that will really kind of bring everything to life in terms of the, uh, you know, the motion of uh, the falling water and uh, how that might uh, look um, in the, uh, I don't know, in its environment and the surrounding area. And uh, I really love doing those types of things too. So anyways, hope you enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Thanks as always for tuning into the channel.